In December 2014, Wisconsin IS, two newly elected assembly members, Republican Romaine Quinn of Rice Lake, who represents the 75th district, and Democrat Mark Spreitzer of Beloit, who represents the 45th, about their goals for the upcoming session. Both are, both are in their 20s, both have local government experience, both are considered rising stars in their parties. Today we circle back to ask them about that session that ended and the fall elections. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Yes. Well, first question, do you think you had a successful session? Romaine, you want to go first? I believe so. And rising stars, I was surprised at that. Did you know you're a rising star, Mark? <laughs> um, no, yes, I think this session was very successful. And I think you can judge your successes based on a lot of different um, meaningful ways to identify it, whether it's not necessarily passing bills, but how do you contribute to legislation that's being formed along the way, um, and maybe even the work you do behind the scenes to get bills going forward, and not only that, uh, potentially changing and stopping bad bills at the same time. So um, I think my session, at least for me personally, has been pretty successful, and I think we can be pretty proud of what we've accomplished. Rising star, Mark. Um, I really do think I had a successful session. Uh, I was able to quickly learn the legislative process and uh, uh, learn about a lot of different issues through the committees that I serve on and, and through the budget process and uh, authored uh, several bills that got bipartisan support and that I think have a real chance of becoming law in the next session or uh, sessions beyond that. And. Uh, also made uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to get around my district and get better connected with people and feel like people really know who I am and know how to get in touch with me and uh, that's something that that is really important so uh, looking forward to next session but uh, all in all I think I was able to hit the ground running and get a lot done. Let's talk about lessons learned during your first session. Lessons learned Mark? Uh, one thing is how about the ledge. <laughs> How long it really takes to uh, to put out a good bill? Uh, you know, there are a lot of bills you can put out an idea quickly and and just kind of get it out there for discussion. But if you really want something to become law and to be good law, it, it takes time to do the research, to go through multiple drafts, to pull together different groups that would be affected by it and and get their feedback and hopefully their buy-in and uh, meet with legislators one-on-one -on -one, uh, across the aisle, especially to try to get support. And the bills that I did get those bipartisan co-sponsorships for and and uh, that I think have a good chance are ones that I spent uh, quite a lot of time on uh, and and that was something that uh, that I definitely learned uh, another thing I learned is just you know how many bills go through how many how many bills get introduced that uh, may or may not ever get a committee hearing or a vote anywhere but uh, that are put out there and uh, you know we spent there are a lot of a lot of things uh, changing areas of law that most people probably don't even know exist uh, that somebody's putting out a bill to do something with. Pretty amazing branch of government, then, right? Yeah. Lessons you learned, Romain? Yeah, I think that's the most exciting branch in, in my mind. Um, I'll reiterate uh, points that Mark made. He's exactly right. Just the tedious process of getting bills um, drafted in the committee through the committee. Um, all the different partners you bring together. Um, you know, when you think you have your ducks in a row, it only takes one group or one misstep and the whole thing can blow up in your face. Um, even on non-controversial items where you would think are pretty common sense, that tends to happen quite a bit. Um, another lesson I learned that most people don't realize too is that, you know, when you talk about, you know, Mark's a Democrat and I'm a Republican, you know, what does that mean? So when I got down here, I'm like, well, great, you know, our party is in control. Um, just because you're a Republican doesn't mean uh, you agree with everything, doesn't mean you agree with the governor all the time, and, and certainly not our Senate counterparts who uh, can be an impediment on a lot of things you're trying to get done. So um, those two things, learning the process, um, how easy it is, and not easy it is sometimes to get bills passed, um, but that everyone down here truly is their own independent actor that really does represent their district and even if they are Democrat or Republican I think most of us really do look after our district first um, and that makes the political process even more interesting I would say. Were you surprised at the partisanship or had you been warned as candidates in 2014 about the partisanship? Although you use the term you were able to assemble some bipartisan support for some of your bills. Were you surprised at the partisanship, Romaine? I think it's your turn to go first. Yeah, and, you know, we heard a lot of that, especially, you know, those on the sidelines during Act 10, maybe, you know, you heard some of the, the horror stories of, you know, the, the, between the protesting and no one ever working together, and there used to be a time where legislators back in the day, they'd all go for a beer together afterwards, and now we have separate bars we go to or things like that. Um, so I assume some of that was going on, but, uh, you know, Mark can attest to in local government, um, it doesn't matter what your p political philosophy is, you have to bring people t together to the table to get things done. So, uh, slightly surprised, but you know, 94% of our bills this session um, did receive bipartisan votes. Obviously, some are way more meaningful than others, uh, in my mind. But 
Um, 94% did receive Republican and Democrat support. So I think it's a testament to some region across the aisle that does still occur. Mark, when you wanted to get a bill passed, since your party is not in control, did you af often have to go to a member of his party to ask him to kind of take to lead, to, to shepherd it through the process? Um, yeah, to either do that or, or to ask them to join me, uh, and, and even if I was going to take the lead to, to join me in, in putting out that bill, uh, and then, then that would get more bipartisan support. And that was something that, that I did on multiple bills. Uh, you know, I wasn't surprised by the partisanship. Uh, I certainly knew what I was getting myself into, but uh, it is disappointing because even though uh, there may be a lot of votes that are bipartisan, uh, the authorship on the vast, vast majority of those bills, the lead author is Republican, and that's something where um, either a Democrat uh, may not get a bill through, even if they ask a Republican to take the lead on it because it's still viewed as a Democratic bill, and I had that happen uh, with one of my bills that didn't get a vote, even though uh, a Republican was the lead on it, uh, or it just uh, may be that uh, you know that they d don't become a priority, and as, as the decisions are made, of there's only so many bills, and and uh, they're not all going to make it. Uh, you know that that becomes a big factor. So th the other piece is a lot of the the bills that are bipartisan, they're looking at much smaller issues than mm -hmm. the big things we do disagree on, like the budget, which probably has has more substantive things in it, both in terms of dollars and policy, than the rest of the legislation we passed almost combined, a and that is is basically a totally partisan process. The Before we get to the budget, <laughs> here's my next question. Name one thing that you guys got passed, either as a standalone or part of the budget, Romain. Uh, well, I had three different bills passed. I think one that was mo most important to my district um, was a l loan program that was only applicable to Milwaukee, the Milwaukee area, and we opened that up so now rural teachers who are just getting the profession in college can apply to that um, and obtain loans through that as well. So okay. anytime we can take a, and like your book you referenced before we got on air here, anytime we can take a program that's designed for just Madison, Milwaukee and can make it applicable uh, to rural Wisconsin or my district is a win in my book. Did you fold that in the budget or was it standalone? No, that was standalone. Okay. Mm -hmm. and Mark, I cut you off earlier. So sure. which one or two bills were, were, were you able to get passed? Uh, there was a bill to bring family care to Rock County uh, this summer uh, and that was something that uh, all the Rock County legislators on a bipartisan basis uh, put that bill out together. We went and, and testified for it and were able to get it through the process pretty quickly and signed into law. Uh, we thought that had been taken care of in the budget and it turned out we basically needed a legislative fix for that so we had to do a standalone bill and, and thankfully that went smoothly and uh, we were able to get that done. So that'll allow Rock County to make a transition to family care uh, as it is now before the transition to what family care might look like in the future and that'll be a smoother process. Now let's talk about the budget. You voted against it, you voted for it. Why did you vote against that, Representative Spritz? I voted against the budget because it really uh, didn't reflect the priorities that I think we need to have as a state. It made severe cuts to institutions that I think are incredibly essential, like the University of Wisconsin system and our public uh, schools uh, and environmental protections. Uh, and it didn't address uh, funding for things like transportation uh, that I think many of us really wanted to find a, a comprehensive funding solution for, and instead it had more borrowing. Uh, and uh, it also included policy changes that uh, I really disagreed with, like some of the changes to family care uh, that are, I think, going to provide lower quality care and, and potentially more profit motive uh, to that. Uh, and uh, so I just, uh, across the board, but the university cut was, was probably the single biggest thing to cut $250 million uh, out of the UW system. And, and uh, that's just not something the system can afford to do. We're seeing the impacts of that on uh, reduced uh, faculty and, and uh, staff support for college students, and uh, I couldn't vote for a budget that made that cut. With your party in control, Romain, you were a part of those caucuses in which your, your caucus literally built a budget. You voted for it, yet Representative Spritzer just listed school funding, transportation, uh, cut the $250 million cut to the UW over two years, let's be clear it's over two years, and cuts to family care. You voted for that budget. Why did you vote for it? Yeah, and in the budget process, obviously, we're both new to it, so it's very interesting. I mean, the governor lines out his priorities and then basically lays it on your lap and says, go ahead, guys, here you go. You know, here's my priorities, and now make it acceptable for you. So there's a number of things that we were able to take a, a fairly decent budget and make it even a better budget. Um, you know, to be able to continue to fund all of our priorities except the 
UW system cut, which I personally did not agree with either. I did offer an amendment to try and shield our two-year colleges and UW Extension yes. um, because I believe they're the most bare-bones institution in the UW system, or as opposed to if you look at UW-Madison, a lot of those cuts were filled just through attrition um, and different, and they have many different foundations and avenues for revenue. So um, there were things in the, in the budget I didn't agree with as well, including um, I think we borrow too much for transportation. I think we need a comprehensive policy solution going forward to fund our transportation system adequately. The budget wasn't a time to do that. Okay, we'll come back and do it a different time. Um, but there were good things in there too. I had a specific fix for my district. Uh, in my district, I have a, two school districts, speaking of school funding, um, that consolidated a couple years back. And we have a really basic policy that says, we'll throw you a pot of money and after those five years are up, that money's just gone. Well, according to the, the school funding formula right now, our districts already get penalized because we're so large. And so when those school districts combined, uh, once that pot of money's gone, they were gonna have to cut 3.2 million out of just over an $11 million budget. So we had a fix um, that allowed them to go above their levy caps up to 75% to help mitigate some of that. So we uh, prevented about a $3.2 million cut um, from a school district right in my district. So I think that was extremely important for our area. Um, and there were other priorities we were still able to make. We did actually add additional money um, for K through 12 schools. K through 12 schools were not cut. Um, you know, the original budget wanted to cut senior care to save about $35 million. Um, you know, some of us wrote a letter to joint finance and said, absolutely not. You know, we can talk about this later on. You know, we are one of the only states that has a supplemental, another supplemental program like senior care. And going forward, maybe w through attrition, we could maybe wean the state out of it, but you don't do it overnight. So um, I think there were a number of victories in the budget. And again, continual investments in making sure property taxes are frozen. We didn't raise income taxes. You know, invested another $15 million um, in worker training. That's the big thing right now. There's jobs all over the place, but people don't have the skills. How do you address that gap? So um, there were things in the budget, again, that I didn't agree with that I think we need to do a better job um, at leading, and I think we're confident we can do that coming out into the next session. Um, but there were some wins specifically for my district. Do you have a rural district? The, the cuts to the UW extension and the two years, you're probably hearing from your constituents about those, aren't you? Yep, and see, that's what was interesting because if you look at UW extension, for instance, you know, UW extension, you can't drive by UW extension campus. You know, mm -hmm. there aren't a ton of advocates for UW extension, but they do critical and crucial work um, in rural Wisconsin. So that's like Representative Ed Brooks and myself um, spearheaded those two budget amendments to try and, and block that. And I have UW Barron County, and you know, Everyone says, well, you want to cut everything else, but not your own. Well, that's not the case. We're trying to recognize the difference um, in the programs that, that rural Wisconsin has and that other areas have that probably have a better um, way of mitigating some of those cuts. Mark, I want to come back to, some, uh, to something that uh, he said. He said school aides, K-12 school aides, went up. Yeah, you listed school aides as one of the reasons you voted against it. Are you saying uh, K-12 school aides didn't go up enough? Um, well, there are two pieces of it. Uh, one is the, the school aides themselves, uh, which uh, have been consistently cut by this administration and, and the Republican leadership uh, that's in power right now, and uh, this budget did nothing to correct that issue. Um, and uh, the other big issue is the voucher expansion, which uh, is a cut to our public schools because uh, it's pulling money directly out of our public school system. And for the first time, this budget did not have a separate funding mechanism for that voucher program. It set it up to directly pull money. Every student that leaves the public school system and transfers to a voucher school, that money is going to be coming directly out of that local public school. Uh, and there's no money uh, to fill that in. So that is something that uh, absolutely is a cut, and, and we need to look at it that way. The estimates show that over the next decade, it could be close to a billion dollars. Uh, so I view that as a cut uh, on top of what is already inadequate funding uh, and a real lack of any local control over funding for our public schools. And we're seeing school districts around the state going to referendum, and we're seeing those referendums pass uh, often by pretty large margins because people are saying they want to fund their public schools, but going to a short-term referendum for operating expenses where you can't have long-range planning is not an efficient way to fund a public school system, and we should have done it as a state in the budget and not blown wide open this voucher program that we don't even know how much money it's going to take out of our public school system. Well, are there any voucher or choice schools in the 75th District, Representative Quinn? Uh, there are not. There and are so not. when I, well, I'll, I'll look at that issue as well, um, you know, in terms of the voucher program. I attended a K-8 Catholic school in my district. You know, it's not part of the choice program. Um, but again, we did add some money. You know, the governor was originally going to cut 150 per pupil. Uh, we restored that and then added another $100 per pupil over the next two years. Um, is it back to pre, um, you know, Act 10 levels? No. And we have a funding formula that I believe discriminates against rural schools. You know, it doesn't take into account poverty. Um, you know, I'm spending about $2,000 per pupil just to get my kid to the door, and that's not even educating the student. 
and we already spend less per capita usually than a lot of inner city schools. But in terms of the voucher program, um, you know, we could look at it, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at it as, you know, a kid leaves a public school and goes to a private school and it's stealing money from that public school. But if I have a child that leaves Rice Lake, where I graduated, my biggest district, and goes to the Cameron School District and open enrolls, Rice Lake doesn't get all that money either. And so I think the only real argument that you have when it comes to the choice program is should public dollars ever flow into an institution that has any religious affiliation. Granted, not all choice schools are religiously affiliated, um, but that to me is the only argument um, that's plausible. Because if you look, if we close the, the voucher program down, the choice program down, and we took all those kids with a voucher in Milwaukee and put them back into K through 12 public schools in Milwaukee, my schools would get even less money because it costs more to send those kids back into K through 12 Milwaukee and that draws even more money for my school. So literally, the voucher program, until we can figure out a better funding formula and find more additional money, um, is preventing my schools from even getting a further cut. And it's easy to say we need to add more money for schools, but if we're gonna have that conversation, um, then let's be honest and say, okay, do income taxes need to go up? Do property taxes need to go up? Does a sales tax need to go up? We have the lowest sales tax. I mean, let's have those conversations with that um, without just saying this needs to go up because we got, it's a two-piece conversation we need to have. And I want to talk about transportation just for a minute. If you could wave a wand, we are borrowing in this biennium $850 million for highways and related transportation. Now, I think you both agree on this. That's not wise, prudent, long-term planning. Right. So if, er, if it were up to you, how would you fund transportation in the next bu uh, budget? Representative Sprites. Um, well, I think we probably need to use uh, a couple of different options, uh, whether it's uh, an increase in the gas tax, vehicle registration fees, uh, some combination. It's probably not just one. Uh, making sure that uh, both local residents but also out-of-state users who come and, and drive on our roads uh, are doing that. You know, Interstate uh, 3990 runs uh, right by Beloit, and uh, we've got a lot of people from Illinois coming up uh, to visit Wisconsin all summer long, and we want to make sure they're helping to and pay for our roads, And all your chambers want that widened. <laughs> Absolutely, and you've right. got your own transportation needs in your rural district. But excuse me, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so you know, so I think uh, something like the the gas tax that's going to make sure that that it's everybody and, and not just Wisconsin residents that are paying for it. Uh, clearly, with gas t prices as low as they've been, this would be a, a time to start uh, increasing that a little bit and making sure that we're uh, restoring the gas tax indexing to inflation so we don't get back in this problem uh, again as, as it starts to lose pace with uh, with costs. So I, I think those are probably the two the two best options. You know, tollings out there is something to be discussed. Uh, I would want to know more what people think of that before I uh, supported it. But vehicle registration fees and gas tax, they both exist. Uh, people already are used to paying them. We just need to do a modest increase, and I think we have the funding we need. Give us the benefit of your closed caucus discussions on those three things, gas tax, vehicle registration fee, and restoring indexing. What did you learn about the transportation debate? And then your solution. You pay for transportation in the next budget. Sure, yeah, ahead. and if only a marker I had a wand to just <laughs> yeah, everything the way we wanted to do. But no, um, you know, that's an interesting conversation. I've spent, you know, a bulk of my time back in the district, you know, asking people about a number of issues, and that's what I ask all the time because we need to fix it. You know, I've looked at the numbers over and over. Um, we're moving forward with an audit of the DOT. I think that's a, our first step, of course, was locking in the transportation fund yeah. constitutionally. Constitutional amendment. So we know every dollar no we diversions. take from you, no diversions. Uh, secondly is to make sure that every dollar we already are spending is the most efficient possible. And after crunching those numbers and looking at that, we can't cut our way out of this. We can't save our way out of this. Um, we have to spend more money um, on infrastructure at some point. So for the most part, what I hear from people, uh, which I'm most open to, is a gas tax because I'm a believer in user fees. You know, we just talked, I drive an Expedition, Mark drives a Ford, Ford Focus. Focus. He obviously wears the road less than I do, but he gets better gas mileage. So I'm going to pay probably more tax than Mark is. Um, and so I'm okay with that because the more I use the road, the more I'm paying. You know, I'm open to looking at registration fees. We had a bill this session that would allow counties to enact their own half percent sales tax. Yep. That would go strictly for roads and not offset the general levy. And it died uh, in your caucus. It did die in my caucus. It was Representative uh, Knudsen's. Uh, it was, and uh, Knudsen's from my area and a good friend of mine, and I was supportive of that bill because I'm not raising your taxes. If you believe through your county government, going back to local control, that you're not spending enough and you're okay with the half percent sales tax, you and your county get to vote for that. And it's not never ending. That's why I'm not sure I'm, I'm okay with the indexing because I don't think anything should be indexed, any tax, just forever on end, always going up at some point. I think there needs to be accountability and discussion as it goes along. Um, so that's why I was okay with that bill, but it's gonna be a number of different solutions. Um, but our infrastructure, it, we're falling behind, our counties are falling behind, and just the cost. If you talk to your local town chairman, 
Um, literally, the cost of building a mile of road has doubled in the last decade um, while their revenues are staying flat. So you've got many townships, we're just grading, grading uh, gravel right now. Yeah. We're not even replacing. So Would you have voted for the Knutson bill had it hit the full uh, floor? I, I would have, and I'm disappointed that it didn't. Uh, it, it wasn't a perfect bill. I, I, there were things that I, I didn't like about it. Uh, <coughs> it. It was, a, I think, a Band-Aid on a problem that we really need to solve as a state and, and come up with uh, a more efficient funding mechanism. I don't think the sales tax, it's not a user fee on the roads, and I, I do support a oh. user fee. But uh, in, in the absence of something else, I would have voted for it. And I think this is one of the political problems that we have in the legislature right now, because that bill probably had about 48 Republican votes. Uh, it would have needed 50 to pass without any Democratic votes. Uh, I just said I would have voted for it, and I know I wasn't the only Democrat. And I know that Republican leadership knew that there were uh, a number of Democrats that would have been willing to vote for it. But the Speaker wouldn't bring it up for a vote unless it had 50 Republican votes. Uh, the Democrats would have had to be extra. We couldn't be the votes that helped get it over the finish line. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way almost everything goes. Uh, and uh, that was really disappointing to see that uh, die, mostly because some Milwaukee area Republicans who uh, largely have already gotten the road projects that they want didn't want to vote for this bill. But if your party's in control next session, there will be demands for to run the assembly in just the same way. Will you support it? Because trust me, I've been up there a few years and I've seen it <laughs> both ways, so uh, the temptation and the uh, momentum will be for your party to run the assembly in the same way. Are you going to fight that? I think there, we've got to have a state that functions, and when we get into a situation where uh, basic needs like transportation are not being met because uh, you refuse to work on a bipartisan basis and one party doesn't have the votes to get it done on their own, uh, then, then that just doesn't work. Uh, and when it's that kind of situation, we need to find a way around it. We need to act responsibly. And it's fine if there are members of a party that say, look, we understand you've got to do this, but we don't want to vote for it, so get some votes from the other party so we don't have to. That seems like a perfectly reasonable way to move forward, not to say, well, if you don't want to vote for it, then uh, even though you're the minority, we're just going to kill it. Okay. I want to ask about $250 million in public funds for the Milwaukee Bucks Arena. What did the constituents in your district tell you about that, Romain? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> and that's uh, the way I voted. So three, three, two words, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah, I've, you know, I've been to a Timberwolves game, um, but I've never been to a Bucks game. You know, just our proximity is so far from Milwaukee, and again, you always have that sentiment of all the, you know, there's, there's no life beyond Highway 8 in my district, according to Madison, Milwaukee. And I'm glad you mentioned, you know, Milwaukee projects got finished first. I mean, that's why myself, along with about 35 other Republicans, signed the outstate Republicans signed a letter and said, absolutely not. If there's not money and you're cutting, uh, you're cutting all projects. You're not just cutting our projects. Right. So, and that's the conflict that goes on. But Bucks, it was a no. Um, what's important, again, to distinguish is that the state is using its borrowing capacity um, with a deal that struck to have it paid back. Um, over and over, again, uh, political opponents and, and pundits will say, you know, we, can, we don't have money for schools, but we have money for this totally separate funds. It's not like we literally, because how convenient that the cut at the UW is the same size. So it's, yes. you literally just cut the UW by the same amount you just gave to the Bucks. Not the case at all. So, um, but I think it's important to invest in Milwaukee. It's very easy for people in my area just to write them off. Uh, but again, if the largest municipality in your state fails or continues to fail on whatever front it may be, um, it affects all of us. Just like if rural Wisconsin fails, it affects Madison and Milwaukee. So um, there are differences and we need to reconcile those. Um, but it's important that Certain solutions we come together on, but the Bucks was not one that I could agree to. What did your constituents tell you about the Bucks deal, Mark? Um, it was split, and I honestly didn't get uh, a lot of constituents uh, giving me feedback on it. So okay. I, I really wanted to dig into the issues and just cast what I thought was the, the smartest vote for Wisconsin and uh, for my constituents. And when I looked at, at the math, remains right that uh, it would have been an easy vote to say, I didn't like this $250 million cut to UW. How could we turn around and spend that money on a Bucks right. arena? But it's not the same dollars. And it is. When I, the, when you're I look, right, it's not. It's, it's, pu it's public funds. Right. City, um, county, excuse me. But, you know, when I looked at the numbers, uh, the slogan, it's cheaper to keep them, was right. Uh, if we thought that they were going to leave uh, without a new arena, uh, the tax money we would have lost uh, was almost twice as much uh, as we're going to be paying for the next 20 years to pay off this debt. Uh, and so uh, I looked at the numbers and I said, you know, we come out about $3 million in the positive every year for the next 20 years by doing this compared to what we could be at if we didn't. And that's $3 million that we can put into our public schools or the university system or our state parks. 
Uh, so I just took a, a sober look at the numbers and said, yeah, you, it would be really easy to make a political argument against this, but the right vote is for it, and that's what I voted. Okay, two specific questions. Number one, what one bill are you glad did not pass this session? Well, a answer that one first. Do you want to go first? W one bill stick out. You're so glad it didn't pass, Mark. Um, sure. Uh, the uh, the bill to restrict access to transgender students using the bathroom. Okay. Uh, that was one that uh, obviously there's been a lot of national discussion on uh, since that came forward, and uh, you know we've seen states like North Carolina that I think are regretting the fact that they did allow bills like that to pass. Uh, that had a hearing in the education committee, and thankfully didn't get beyond that. And that was one that uh, I've got a lot of transgender friends, and uh, as a openly gay member of the legislature, really felt the need to speak up on that issue and. Okay. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, it didn't become law, and I hope it doesn't come back in the future. One bill that you're glad did not pass? Sure, yeah. We had one bill that dealt with uh, county veteran service offices, um, and That's it was right. kind of mischaracterized a little bit, and that tends to happen a lot in this building down here uh, due to a number of people's faults. Um, but just the idea of being able to consolidate that, um, I think too many counties would take advantage of that even when they didn't need to, and you would have saw a reduction to benefits uh, for veterans. So I'm glad to see that bill went away. And what, um, what one bill do you wish would have passed and didn't? Romain, your turn. Well, and honestly, Mark and I disagree on this. Um, I think there's a number of bills this session when you talk about fetal baby parts. I tend to be a very social conservative, um, especially on this issue, too. And Mark and I don't agree, and um, we talk about this all the time. And you sat through hours of that committee testimony on that um, bathroom bill as well. Um, but I think that's one that's important. And I think it, I mean, whether you look at North Carolina or other states, um, it does not matter when you're talking. I'm not talking about in Target or your private business. We're talking about school children and whether or not you believe there is a, um, an important factor in separating the sexes in shower rooms and school children's bathrooms um, when they're not legally adults. And I think it's very important. I think the state should take a stand on that. And I think the Obama administration that's been coming down on school districts across the country, especially as close as Illinois, is completely wrong on this. And I think it was important that we back our school districts up on those policies. The question mark is what one bill do you wish would have passed? Uh, nonpartisan redistricting reform. Uh, that's the biggest one. I uh, was the lead author of a bill to bring Iowa style uh, nonpartisan redistricting to Wisconsin to uh, oh. get the political influence out of how we draw our legislative and congressional districts so that representatives really get to choose their voters, uh, or so, so the voters get to choose their representatives in competitive elections rather than representatives choosing their voters, uh, which is really what we have in the current process. Uh, you know, we're one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. Uh, very few of us have to run in, in truly competitive elections uh, where the other party has a chance of winning the seat, and I think that makes for worse representation, uh, and it's something we can fix. So I was the lead author of, of that bill in the assembly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't even get a public hearing. Uh, there was sort of this uh, uh, information only, invited speakers only hearing after the legislative session had ended, but uh, no hearing on the bill, uh, no real action. And, and that's probably the, the biggest disappointment because I think that is at the root of so many of the other policy discussions we have. If we have a legislature that uh, isn't representative and doesn't feel the, the political pressure from voters back home to do the right thing, uh, then it's too easy for legislators to cast the wrong votes. Well, just a historical footnote, in the 2009-2010 session when it was Democratic Governor Jim Doyle and your party controlled both houses, that didn't get any traction then either. A and I think that was a, a mistake and I that's understand. why as a freshman uh, I w was happy to take a lead on it along with my fellow freshman Democrats because you know we weren't there then and, and yes. we recognized that things can be done better in the future. Okay, um, we're almost out of time so if, uh, questions on politics. Why, why are you both seeking re-election, number one, number two? What will be your top priority assuming you're re-elected? Your turn. Um, well, I'm seeing re-election because there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I've put out uh, bills that I think really have a chance of passing in the future, and I want to keep working on that, and I want to keep pushing on, on the budget issues that uh, clearly that'll be the biggest thing we do in the next session as it was now, and there are so many issues left over from this past budget that I think we need to go in a very different direction. And the first on. bill you're going to sponsor, assuming your re-election, is what? Um, probably putting out this uh, bill that I did this session on uh, reimbursement for new farmers for student loans. Uh, it's something that uh, has some bipartisan support and uh, thanks to I Romaine for Are you yeah. a yeah. okay. being one and I think that's one that really has a chance of moving. It came out late in the session this time so I'm excited to get it out early next time. Why are you running? Top priority next well, session? Well, news here, I technically haven't announced my re-election yet, but uh, I am rerunning, so on your okay. program first. Um, All right, but no, Thank there's, you. there's a number of uh, really important issues. 
I think the biggest thing when you talk about uh, rural school funding or school funding in general, the transportation fund, all these solutions, um, we need to have really strong rural voices in this assembly. And I think that's the most important part. When you talk about these solutions, it may look good on paper and it may technically kind of fix the problem, but a lot of these solutions always leave northern Wisconsin out in the cold. Um, and that's why I'm rerunning uh, to be that voice for rural Wisconsin. Final Minnesota. question. I wouldn't be a good interviewer if I didn't ask this. What are your thoughts up the, on the upcoming presidential election with presumptive nominees Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? Romain? Sure. Well, I think both of our first picks are probably pretty much out of the race, even though Mark might not admit it. Um, I am personally no fan of Hillary Clinton. Um, and of course, I am part of the Republican Party, and Donald Trump was not my first choice, um, but he will uh, earn my support this November. And you were in here talking about why you liked not Hillary Clinton, correct? Uh, no, I had I did not okay. choose. Uh, okay. I liked both uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I uh, apologize. <laughs> I, I didn't make an endorsement. I think that was the right choice uh, to, to let the voters decide. And, and uh, it does appear that Democratic voters uh, have chosen Hillary Clinton. I think, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders is, is sticking in the race. He certainly has the right to do that. And I appreciate the issues that he's raised and the passionate campaign he's run. I, I got to see both him and Hillary Clinton uh, multiple times. Uh, but uh, it looks like we have our nominees, and I'm very excited for uh, Hillary Clinton to be our next president. I think she's one of the most qualified people to have run for president uh, other than an incumbent president themselves, and uh, breaking ground as our first woman president. And there are going to be so many clear contrasts with Donald Trump. I, th I think it's really unfortunate that the Republican Party has nominated somebody that, uh, that has put out such divisive rhetoric and really tried to tear this country apart in order to get a presidential nomination. And I know that many of my Republican colleagues are, are wishing that he hadn't been nominated. But uh, clearly, it sets up a contrast of, of one person who uh, has been in public life for, for decades and is, is extremely qualified to be president in Hillary Clinton, uh, and another person who's, who's been in public life uh, almost as a, a joke for decades and, and yet somehow managed to bully his way to the Republican nomination. Oh, Romaine, in the interest of balance, I've got to give you a chance to respond. What concerns you about a president? Clinton. Sure, and I like the fact that I'm totally ready for a woman president, but I don't think a lot of those cards matter. It goes down to about the issues and where you're at on the issues. Um, I don't think she's been a very good Secretary of State. I think there's a number of issues with her past and Bill Clinton's past. Um, and I think, you know, again, Donald Trump is not my first choice. My biggest fear is the Supreme Court. Um, I want another Scalia on that Supreme Court, and I think if we have a Republican Senate, uh, they will be able to appoint hopefully and steer Mr. Trump in the right direction. Uh, Donald Trump's not conservative enough for me, um, but again, he'll be the nominee and, and hopefully we can keep moving the country forward and make some real progress after eight years of basically stale government in my mind. Well, thank you. Representative Quinn, Representative Spreitzer. Glad to be here. Fascinating civil dialogue, I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Congratulations on your first term, terms. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.